Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar with eNautic. My name is Emily. I'm the Senior Campaign Lead here at Virtual. And just before I introduce you to Paul and Josh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we are coming to you from today. Virtual is based on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. As I mentioned today, I am joined by Josh and Paul from eNautic. So Virtual's working with eNautic on their upcoming crowdsource funding campaign. A few of you might be unfamiliar with what crowdsource funding or CSF is, or you might know it as equity crowdfunding, but it's a relatively new form of fundraising in Australia, which allows small businesses and startups to raise capital from a large number of smaller or retail investors, as well as wholesale or sophisticated investors through an online platform such as virtual. So instead of seeking funds from traditional sources such as venture capitalists or banks, uh, companies can turn to the general public and often that's their communities to raise money in exchange for equity in their business. Virtual Financial Services is the licensed intermediary for this offer. And I just want to remind everybody who's here today that the information and discussion in this webinar is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as financial advice or a recommendation to invest. So I would implore you to do your own research and always consider the offer document and general CSF risk warning before investing. If you do need any more information or have any questions, please head to virtual.com or email us at support at virtual.com. So how today's session is going to run, Josh and Paul will take us through a 15 minute presentation and that will explain a little bit about where they've come from and what they're looking to achieve with this raise. We'll then switch to a Q&A session. So if you have a look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see a Q&A box. If you've got any questions during the presentation, please just pop them in there and then we'll endeavor to get through as many as possible in today's session. Uh, I also want to remind you that we are recording today's session. So if you do need to jump off early or if you'd like to send it to somebody who might find it interesting, a recording will be sent around afterwards. So... I've finished talking. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the team at eNautic. Paul, you are on mute. Hi there, everyone. Um, thanks very much for joining this webinar. Really excited to introduce you to uh, eNautic today and to just let you know what we're about, what we're doing, and uh, I guess what we're raising money uh, for. Um, I'm going to share a short deck with you, if you'll bear with me. Hopefully you can all see that. Should be a green screen with a boat on it. Um, so eNautic is an electric hydrofoil technology company. Uh, we're based in Perth. Um, we are about... Uh, enabling the pivot from uh, traditional boats to electric boats. And we strongly believe that the way to do that is through making them hydrofoil. So traditional boats um, are noisy, uh, they're polluting, and they have high maintenance costs. Um, we, and I think a large part of the world, uh, believes that the future of boating is electric. However, it's challenging to make electric boats because when you put heavy batteries in them, uh, they sink the boat into the water and then you've got to push all that weight out of the way constantly. So the way to make boats electric efficiently is to make them hydrofoil boats. Once you put them on hydrofoils, you save about 80% of the resistance. Suddenly you've got a fast boat with good endurance that's fully electric. So just going through, hammering through, I guess, the, the details of this, uh, Air and water pollution is an issue for boating. It's causing some kinds of craft to be mandated off waterways around the world. They're noisy. Uh, they require high power, uh, very high power compared to cars many times. Um, they have high operating costs. It's a wet ride, generally speaking. Uh, it's a lot uncomfortable because of waves cause the boat to rock and roll. Heaps and heaps of work that I've been heavily involved with over the years trying to make boats more comfortable. And they produce uh, a wake, which uh, annoys people around the boats. So uh, if you put an electric motor in the boat, you mostly solve the emission problem in that there's virtually no uh, air or water emissions. And you take away a lot of the noise. You've still got the noise of the waves uh, slapping against the hull, but the engine noise is gone. 
However, all those other problems remain. So once you put an electric boat on hydrofoils, all of those problems are resolved by saving, you save 75 to 90% of the resistance. So that means that your battery powered boat can now have very good range and high speed. Um, there's virtually nothing to do in terms of maintenance of a battery powered craft right through to the point where you change the batteries. Um, so day to day maintenance is very small. Because you're sitting up above the waves, you, it's a dry ride. You don't get splash, splash you don't get spray. Um, and you're also very comfortable because you're disconnected from the waves um, and the hydrofoil flies comfortably above waves. And really importantly, I think, you don't make any wash. So you can operate a hydrofoil craft at speed right next to another water user like a rowing boat, uh, people on the beach, boats moored nearby, and you don't cause any annoying rock and roll. So I thought we'd just start just to introduce Josh and myself. Um, my name's Paul Steinman. I'm a uh, mechanical engineer by training some many years ago, uh, and I spent my life working in naval architecture. Um, started life as a, a hydrofoil research scientist for America's Cup campaigns uh, way back in the 90s, uh, and then spent some time at Austral Ships um, designing as a lead uh, naval architect for their 86 metre uh, high-speed aluminium ferries, uh, and then uh, moved into their ride control uh, group, which was all about trying to make uh, boats comfortable uh, at great expense and with lots of science. Um, and then decided to develop a alternate way of stabilizing boats, which I spent seven years developing and then sold that uh, to a company here in Perth. They listed their company a few years later. Um, and then I worked for them for uh, about 10 years in all uh, and joined uh, eNordic uh, recently as the CEO. Um, so here we are raising money to go from a technology development company into commercialization. I'll hand it over to Josh to introduce himself. Thanks, Paul. Uh, it's been an exciting journey developing this technology. And uh, my background was in drones, so about a decade in drones and about a decade in uh, manned electric aircraft. And about half a decade ago, we started dabbling with the uh, electric hydrofoil technology, as Paul will uh, give you a bit of a history lesson soon. Uh, but it's been great having Paul on for the last 10 or so months and really driving the commercial focus of the company, because the first few years has really been about developing the uh, technology, doing the research, and uh, uh, all the lessons of hard knocks, the school of hard knocks of um, experimental development. And we've got so much knowledge and, and technology and IP now that it's at the precipice of commercialization. And Paul's wealth of background in marine commercialization is uh, really complimenting our team here as uh, technologists and innovators. So yeah, back to Paul, thanks. Thanks, Josh. Um, so I just wanted to give you a bit of, uh, a, I guess, a timeline of the developments that most of this is pre my time at uh, at eNordic, although I've been following this because uh, the C, the previous CTO of the company is a, a colleague who worked for me for 10 years. Um, and that's actually the connection between myself uh, and this company is that um, uh, for 10 years, the guy who was the primary developer of this technology uh, worked for me and then asked me to join, uh, to come and lead the company with Josh uh, yeah, about 10 months ago. So this company started, the technology started off, it was incubated in a, in a company that at the time uh, had aspirations to do a, build electric aircraft. Um, and they formed a small skunk works, if you like, or tech group um, to say, hey, could we, why can't we electrify a boat? They soon worked out that it was really hard to electrify boats because of the, uh, the energy demand to push the water out of the way. And they very quickly worked out it needed to be a hydrofoil boat. So way back in 2019, Enordic was the first company in the world to have a fully uh, automatically controlled submerged foiling uh, jet ski. And then that evolved into uh, this, uh, basically using a rotor molded canoe body. I think basically they're looking for cheap hulls to put on top of the tech package, which was the foils and the control system. Uh, in 21, that evolved further into further evolution of the hydro, uh, hydrofoil system and the control system. And then some, I think it was in about 22, Josh can correct me, but one of the big uh, opera, uh, recreational product OEMs in the world approached the company and said, look, we've had a fantastic experience moving from quad bikes where people sit in line behind each other 
to these UTVs, which are kind of like a souped up uh, golf cart. They're super popular in the States and around the world. And so they said their experience was when people could sit next to each other and share the experience, they had a much better engagement from their riders. And so eNordic pivoted to this two-seater side-by-side -side thing, which you see in 2023, uh, and developed what's now called the Wavefly Volare. Um, and a video of that, there was home shot, uh, no external uh, resources, just an in-house video, was put up on Instagram and received uh, about 5 million views, which for our little company here in Perth, we thought was pretty amazing. Um, and also elicited uh, a bunch of people who reached out uh, and expressed interest uh, to reserve a production slot for that boat when it went into production. Um, so in 2024, uh, we released uh, the Rogue, which is actually the identical tech package, but with a uh, hull arrangement, hull configuration that is in line and looks very much like a jet ski, except that the hull flies about a metre above the water. And it's super fun to drive because it banks heavily um, and flying a meter above the water at, at 25 knots is uh, really pretty fun. So that's kind of where we are today. And I guess where we are is we've come out of, of an intense period of technical development. And we now have a robust uh, prototype that flies on demand and we're ready to go into a commercial phase. So we're looking at markets uh, that we've sort of siloed into recreation, uh, which is what we're going to address uh, with this virtual raise, with your funding, hopefully. Um, we're definitely focused on recreation now. And the next step with another funding round is to address the commercial market. There's a niche luxury uh, opportunity that's uh, fun, exciting, and, and looks really cool, but doesn't really represent a huge amount of money for us. But certainly the commercial fast ferries, crew transfer vessels for the offshore wind industry and also the existing oil and gas industry um, is a really exciting opportunity for us. And we'll be doing that with new funding uh, after, after we get the recreational products bedded in. Uh, military is something that we're receiving contacts from and we're responding to those, I guess, somewhat reactively. We're not going to invest a lot of balance sheet in that um, because the timeframes are really difficult for a startup to manage but there's some really exciting uh, inquiries coming in uh, through the military space. So for now, we're focused on the left-hand side of the screen recreation, and that's what this virtual fundraise is all about. So I guess I could be wrong, but in my mind, uh, there's clearly a booming market, uh, small, nascent, but really fast growing market globally for electric hydrofoil vessels. Um, there's uh, other startups in the space um, it's, it's growing really fast. So why invest in eNordic of all of those uh, electrical hydrofoil companies? I think the, the answer is pretty clear in my mind. Um, we have contributed something really substantial to the development of hydrofoil technology. Hydrofoil started off as a series of foils in ladders in the left. Uh, it was started on uh, Lake uh, Maggiore in uh, Italy. The Italians started this. Um, and then this V-styled uh, system was uh, developed initially by a German fellow and that really dominated hydrofoil technology. We had these in Australia. Um, they were all over the world, these um, so-called uh, surface piercing hydrofoils. Um, and then in about, about the same time, about the early 50s, um, Gibbs and Cox in the US made a small wooden boat uh, that had a fully submerged hydrofoil that didn't surf pierce the surface of the waves. And that allowed the boat to go really fast without being impacted by wave profile. Uh, and the US military got heavily involved in that and uh, Grumman Aerospace, Lockheed Martin, Boeing Aerospace were all contracted to build several vessels uh, over about a 25 year period. Um, and that became, and it still is the state of the art, which is basically a flat wing under the water supported by struts. Um, and all of the companies in this new rush to electrify hydrofoils are using that technology. What eNordic has done is flip that on its head and develop this thing called the W foil. The W foil is, uh, we have patents uh, pending globally. So there is a roadblock or a moat around us um, 
th that technology enables much higher agility and also the ability to foil higher above the waves. Um, I certainly believe it's a game changer and it's the prime uh, differentiator that we have over the rest of the world. So our version, uh, the implementation of that, we call the W foil. Um, it's a hydrofoil, that angle, the anhedral angle, doesn't look like much. It's just a simple piece of geometry. Um, but as I'll show you in a little while, it has some pretty uh, amazing impacts. The development of this is highly inspired by jet aircraft design, fighter jet aircraft design. Um, as you see in the top right, uh, civilian and normal aircraft have what's called a dihedral angle. So the wings are sort of sitting up this way. That makes the plane nice and stable. It automatically recovers from banking, but it also reduces the agility of that aircraft. Fighter jets, in order to develop really agile, aggressive, dynamic dogfighting maneuvering, have the angle the other way. And aerospace engineers call that an anhedral angle. That creates something that you, a pilot can't fly by what by uh, cable. So if you have a normal joystick control, pilots will always end up in a dive. So they have to be computer controlled. But once the computer control is implemented, you end up with a very dynamic, agile craft um, that is also can fly stably under computer control. The other thing we've taken from jet fighter jet design is these uh, on the bottom right, these wingtip tanks. What they do is they effectively uh, prevent flow leakage from the sides of the wings, and it gives you more lift for a certain wingspan. So if your wingspan is constrained, you get much more lift by putting these uh, tanks at the edge. On a boat, the wing we want to constrain our wingspan to the beam of the boat. So there's not foils and stuff sticking out the side, which, which makes docking hard and interfacing with other boats difficult. So if your foils are, are nicely contained inside the boat, then the boat can operate like a normal boat um, with much higher lift. So that's the W foil. And this is what it does. Uh, that simple bend, uh, I don't want to get into science here, but basically for the same amount of foil, so the same cost and the same drag of foil, you end up with much higher roll torque. So you get the same forces, well, actually more with these uh, wing tanks, but the angles, the fact that it's bent out to the side like that means that you get a much bigger lever arm around the center of mass of the boat. So we can create a lot more torque for the same span of hydrofoil. Uh, and what's really cool about that is as you foil higher above the water, that advantage increases. So we get a double effect. So what do we get out of that? We get the ability to operate craft with a W foil at higher foiling heights. And simply that means you can operate hydrofoils in bigger waves. As you foil higher, you can also bank more steeply because what limits your banking is the hull uh, touches the water and you can't bank any further. So you foil high, you can bank harder and you can turn more aggressively. Now you don't always want to turn aggressively, but this gives you the ability to turn really aggressively. So we've implemented that uh, into what we call the wave drive. The wave drive is a modular hydrofoiling system that's uh, effectively like a, a water jet system or an outboard that you can in integrate into another boat. All of our development has been aimed at making this technology easily accessible to third parties, to shipbuilders, uh, to large um, recreational marine equipment builders so that they can adopt it easily. Um, so it's made up of a foiling system with two side struts. Uh, those side struts have a retraction mechanism and there's a battery energy storage system and a helm control system. It can be joystick control or wheel and throttle control, both uh, electrically identical, but obviously depending on user preference. And then that, that modular system is then able to be integrated into a large range of hulls. So what we've done purely to have a floating boat as a demonstrator is we put it on this white, uh, nice curvy uh, hull that is intended to be a, a rental craft or a personal mobility craft, but really it's a, it's a, a, a way for us to prove up our hydrofoil system and our control system. So you can see in the top, in the middle, uh, the foils are extended and below that you can see the foils retract up to, into pockets in the hull. And then the boat can be driven onto the beach. It can be driven onto a trailer. Uh, it can maneuver in very shallow water. 
Uh, it's actually got a lot less draft than an outboard boat. So the boat can operate in hull mode, just like a boat. Uh, and then on the right, there's some uh, future uh, concepts that we're, we're in the process of releasing. Really excited about this rib idea because it's just so, got so much utility and so many use cases. So a key part of uh, our helm station is uh, our hydroflight flight controller. The flight controller has algorithms that are written specifically to utilize the benefits of the W foil, doesn't foil like other hydrofoils. Uh, it requires a specific automatic control system. Uh, and that automatic control system is our hydroflight control system. So the Volare is, was the first hull developed by us. And most of the videos that you may or may not have seen online, there's plenty of videos if you haven't seen them on our YouTube uh, and Instagram sites. Um, is a two-seater side-by-side, just fun boat. It's intended to be uh, something that you can rent at a resort, or if you live on a waterfront property, it's something that you can take to the shops, up to the golf course, down to your mate's place to have a beer, whatever. It's a, it's a small craft. You push a button and it flies. You know, basically a 10-year-old can fly the thing. There's no skill required. Um, so it's whatever the local regulations uh, uh, require in terms of age can fly it. Uh, and the other really cool use case for it is as a toy to go into the garage of a super yacht to replace a, a jet ski, for instance. It's about the same size. Um, it takes one hour to charge these things, up to one hour. You can charge them up uh, in 20 minutes if you just half charge them. Um, yeah, retractable foils and has the benefit of this uh, super high maneuverability, which makes it really fun. The cool thing about it though, is you can select flight control settings from one to five. One is basically a boring, uh, safe, uh, you know, docile mode that you can go shopping. You can, you can have your granny drive it or whatever, whoever, it's someone who really wants just a safe ride, right up to level five, which frankly is pretty scary and takes some use, getting used to requires skill and practice. And it really throws you around. So the, the next version, this Rogue is a step over uh, jet ski sort of alternative to a jet ski. Uh, so it's a jet ski that flies a meter above the water, uses exactly the same tech package, just a different hull configuration. Uh, that is in development. It's, we don't have a prototype of that fly, flying yet. When we do, uh, you won't be able to get me on the phone because I'm going to be out in the waves enjoying that thing. I'm super excited about it. Um, we've also developed a variant that's uh, really in response to inquiries from uh, defence operators uh, as a uh, unmanned system that can carry sensor payloads, logistic payloads, uh, uh, people, uh, lots of use cases for it uh, as an unmanned craft. Um, and we've demonstrated that unmanned operation uh, recently just at a defence conference here in Perth and got a lot of excitement in that area. So just run through a few features of the craft, uh, really simple to operate. Uh, a lot of people that I speak to think, oh, hydrofoils are super technical, difficult things to maintain and operate. You just push a button, it flies up to height, you're sitting a meter above the water and then you steer it and you change the speed. Uh, it's easier to drive than a boat. Uh, when you want to stop, you just let go of the uh, controls and the thing lands on the water safely and stops in a very short stopping distance. Um, you can move from side to side. You can have a big guy on one side and a little kid on the other. The flight control system handles all that. It's a fully autonomous computer controlled flight controller. So you just need to tell it when you want to steer. Otherwise it'll do all the work for you. Um, there's a push button retract. So if you're approaching the beach, you just say retract foils and the foils come up and drive the thing onto the beach. Uh, there's a bunch of other features on there, which um, I guess are all on our website. Um, and I'll can answer questions on that later. So a really cool thing that happened to us uh, as a small tech company was we put this video up on Instagram and uh, about 160, a bit more than 160 people reached out and said, hey, we really want one of these and we'll give you a hundred bucks to get on uh, a waiting list. So they have become, I guess for us, a future client list, but when we do go into production, which is what we're planning to do with this virtual money uh, and also a group of people we can reach out to and learn from uh, and, and ask about their preferences and uh, price tolerance, all of those things. Um, and actually the feedback from them is really driving this, um, this uh, rib development. 
Um, we've had we've got a lot of global resellers that are sitting there, frankly, tapping their fingers, saying, "Come on, guys, go into production. We want to sell these things." Um, and we are lucky to have a list of people that we can sell our first batches to. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a bunch of military interest um, that we're responding to reactively. Uh, well, we've, there's, that's a short list of a bunch of awards. One of our young uh, design engineers is uh, mad keen on applying for awards and he seems to win a lot of them. So it's uh, good fun. So what's next? So that's basically that recreational craft is what this virtual raise is all about. It's what we're going to spend uh, your investment on developing and putting into the marketplace. The future for us is, uh, I guess, moving up, I guess, simplistically speaking, moving up into larger boats. Um, we have what we call a W foil system, which is the W foil at the back and a more traditional T foil at the front. Uh, the same uh, uh, arrangement of battery electric storage system, pump station and height sensors. That then gives us options into, uh, you know, I guess the eight to 15 meter kind of boat um, uh, there's a large variety of those that we're talking to various um, manufacturers and operators about options for that. Um, down the bottom right, there's an insertion rib which uh, is, it has a military application. Um, I'm really keen on the Venice taxis, but that's uh, an evolving space. We don't have a contract in that space yet, but we're, we certainly are keen on doing that. And then moving up from that, a W foil, foil, W foil forward and aft is a, a perfect solution for a catamaran. Um, so catamaran, I, I see catamaran fast ferries as being the biggest and crew transfer vessels, which are a variant of a fast ferry. Um, I see them as our biggest uh, dollar value market going forward in the years to come. Um, yeah, so I'll, I can answer questions on that as we go forward. But that's a huge growth area. There's a lots and lots and lots of aluminium high-speed uh, catamaran fast ferries in the world. Many of them are over 40 years old. Uh, they're very polluting, they create wake, they consume an awful amount of fuel. Um, I see a massive opportunity for us in the future to go and replace those with uh, foiling fast ferries. Uh, talked about military applications, so here's just a snapshot. Uh, fast personnel transport is effectively a fast ferry. Uh, there's several of many of those in operation around the world using catamaran hull forms. Um, lots of opportunity for us to get into that uh, personnel transport space. Uh, on the left, spe uh, special ops insertion, just a way to get our highly trained special ops guys ashore, dry, uh, unseen and uh, comfortably. Uh, and then the range at the bottom is commercial, uh, military applications for our little recreational uh, range using the wave drive. So that's kind of a bit of an update of uh, where we're at today and what we see our future being. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions if you have any. Thanks so much, Paul. That was super informative. Really, really interesting to see the capabilities in the future as well. So um, obviously you're coming to equity crowdfunding. Why have you decided to go through the equity crowdfunding route versus um, traditional funding? Well, in short, we're we're in a bearish market at the moment, um, globally. I think that not, that includes uh, virtual. I'm sure you're seeing that on your platform across, as a as an average. Um, we have recently closed what we called a pre-series A round uh, at a just short of 1.5 million dollars. Um, what our our next big fundraise will be in the US. Um, we we had a funding shortage to get, we want to accelerate getting these recreational craft into the marketplace. And so the, frankly, the speed and efficiency that platforms like virtual offer, uh, offer us to raise money relatively quickly. And also it kind of, it gives everyone a chance to invest in us uh, in the, in the normal uh, way of things, investing in companies like us is only available to very high net worth people. Um, so this, this gives the, people a chance to invest in us and, and get on the ride with us. And that's kind of exciting for us because I guess what this money is about is taking what is currently a pretty expensive technology and engineering that to a cost price point so that the broad majority of people can get involved and own one of these things. Right now, our craft are very expensive. Our aim is to get them to the point where, you know, middle-class Australian people uh, can, can buy them and enjoy this uh, really fun technology. I can add to that, Emily, if you wanted. 
So just to add to that, um, it's been great to engage with the community more because like uh, Paul said, you know, usually these tech companies uh, grow in a private way and raise from sophisticated you know, investors, VCs, but actually engaging the community to have a say, both in reserving the craft and um, having some equity in the company, gives this great um, camaraderie of the community of what they want to see in this technology. And, and like uh, Paul said, trying to make it affordable and accessible for everyone to enjoy. So it's great to make that available for the public to participate early on. I think that's a good segue to our next question. Um, what is the projected retail cost? So retail pricing at, at the moment, we launched uh, at the Sanctuary Cove Boat Show a couple of months ago, a limited batch of craft and the price point was $140,000 Australian. Now that most ordinary Australians, that's gonna make their eyes water uh, and it's really not an affordable option. So that was being offered to a niche set of the community that own super yachts, that own large waterfront properties, uh, and for whom plus or minus fifty or hundred thousand dollars isn't really a deal breaker for them. So we've we've done that because it gives us a chance to sell a limited number of units built here in Perth with an expensive supply chain and expensive workforce, but they will be a super high quality product that will only be built as a short run. And so they'll, they will become a unique thing. Um, our aim, we, we've had pretty deep discussions with big uh, recreational craft manufacturers in the US who know their market very well. We have ultimately betted down a price point of around about $50,000 US, which is $75,000 Australian roughly, um, which is still an expensive boat, right? But it's a unique boat that flies above the water, uh, you can operate it without annoying anyone else because it's silent, there's no smell and there's no noise, uh, there's no wake. So yes, it's a, it's a, it'll always be an expensive boat as I think all electric boats are at the moment. There will be a learning curve over the years and those prices will come down. But that's our, our target is to be selling boats in that price point. Yeah. And just to add, uh, if you use the Tesla analogy, the Valare is like the roadster of the uh, launch product that is exciting and high early adopters, high net worths can afford, but it is a matter of time. Oh, it looks like Josh is frozen. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you though, Paul. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think Josh was alluding to, obviously in the, in the, in the development uh, road track for all technologies, um, they generally start off expensive and the price comes down. Uh, when I bought, bought my first large screen TV, it was $22,000. Now I can buy the same thing for uh, just over $1,000. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. Yeah. So what would the price premium be um, over a traditional um, 16 to 20 foot craft? Uh, well, we haven't we haven't got to the point of a sixteen to twenty foot craft uh, to price those at this point. Um, that's next uh, for us. So we're, we're at the moment we've got this three meter uh, craft range. So there's, there will be a range of four craft. The rib version of that craft is really focused on uh, bringing the cost down. Um, I'm hoping that that price will actually get significantly under what we just talked about. Um, yeah, so it's always going to be an expensive boat, but it's an expensive boat with some pretty unique features that I think are going to be very attractive uh, to, you know, a, a pretty, pretty broad range of the market. Um, the idea being that if you've got, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 foot boat um, and you've got a t rib tender, which they all have, um, that you can buy one of these ribs, uh, replace it in the same cradle that, of the ribs you've got um, and have a rib that you can foil Foil up to your boat, retract the foils, and then uh, and and put it on the back of your boat. Brilliant. And do you have a time frame until these boats will be available for purchase, even at the um, higher retail price? Yeah. So it's to be frank, it's sub it's subject to funding, and that's why we haven't taken orders yet because right now we don't have the balance sheet to to go into production. So mm -hmm. the whole purpose of this raise is to get us a starting point. Once we have a balance sheet that we can realistically project, uh, I think it's going to be around about nine months because I think there's a period of probably four to six months of production planning and engineering, which is not R&D, it's just simply 
putting all the drawings and the manuals and the field books and what have you together. And then going into production is not, doesn't really take that long, a few months. So yeah, I think I'd be reasonably safe at saying nine months after we accept orders and what's stopping us from accepting orders at the moment. And we've got quite a few borderline grumpy customers because they've been waiting for us to go into production uh, is having a, having a balance sheet that we can responsibly say that we can deliver. And that's what this is all about. Brilliant. So what happens if the boat does hit an obstacle? Is that an issue? Yeah, it's an issue for hitting an obstacle on any boat. It's an issue. Um, the nice thing about our the way Inordica's approached Hydrofoils is we came, Perth is an aluminium boat building town. I've designed uh, and been involved in building lots of aluminium boats. So we, our foils are extruded aluminium sections. Um, which is, I think, makes us pretty unique in the electric hydrofoiling boat space. Most of the foiling systems have come from the America's Cup. And so they're expensive uh, composite carbon fiber monocoque, which is a single molding. So if you hit anything, you've got to replace the whole foil. They're not very repairable. Uh, our system is a bolted assembly of aluminium parts. So if you hit something and you put a dint or a scratch in it, um, you can replace that part. Uh, and they're relatively... Whilst the boats, they're the cheap part, actually. The tech part, the foils, uh, is actually the, the less expensive part. It's all the electronics and the hull that's the expensive bit. Um, yeah, so if you hit something, yes, it's an issue. Um, typically, you'd retract your foils and and go back, go home, and uh, order a replacement part for whatever's damaged. Good to know. Uh, what type of batteries are you using for the boat and where are you sourcing them from? Uh, good question. So we, we from the outset, a uh, decision made before I arrived and a decision that I I think is an excellent one, it, we are fundamentally battery agnostic. We make a space available in the craft for a battery pack. We are currently using NMC because lithium ion uh, NMC batteries have the highest energy density on the market. They're basically the same tech that's in a Tesla. Um, uh, we are looking closely at other chemistries as they come along. Um, uh, lithium ion phosphate is, is one of those technologies. Hydrofoils are very weight sensitive. Uh, so we like to keep the highest energy, energy density we can. As soon as uh, lithium ion phosphate becomes feasible, we'll, we'll adopt it or the, tech, or the chemistry that leapfrogs that because uh, battery chemistry is probably one of the fastest growing uh, sciences in the world and we're open to whatever the best technology is. At the moment, the best technology is NMC. Never heard so much about battery types in my life as recently on the virtual platform because we've got an electric motorcycle company, an electric aeroplane company, and an electric boat company. Yeah. And well, everybody's got so many questions about the batteries. Yeah, well, I noticed, I, I've watched a couple of your uh, recordings of those and uh, I, it seems to me that Nearly everyone's using NMC at the moment because of the, technically they have the best specs and their safety record is epic as compared to other forms of transport. So there's a lot of doomsayers around Tesla fires and stuff. The reality is that the stacks, the statistics don't support that. They, they, they're very safe. Um, so there's, but we'll move to whatever the best chemistry is as it comes along. And, and all of our design is around making that battery compartment a module that's swappable. Yeah. Awesome. Who are your main competitors and where are they at? It's an interesting question. So in the recreational space, which is what this fundraise is all about, we have very few competitors. Um, there's a company in uh, the Bay Area of San Francisco that's actually started by another Aussie um, who are very focused on a sort of jet ski alternative like our like our rogue. Um, however, they, and again, it comes back to this W foil thing. If you're trying to make a really cool, uh, dynamically aggressive maneuvering craft, you need to be able to throw your guy around. I mean, what I've sort of said to our engineering team is if you can't take a fit 30 year old bloke and break his ribs, then you haven't got a, an exciting toy, right? That's, you have to have the potential for fun and excitement. And what's really cool about it is you can then dial the, the FCL or the flight control level down to one 
and then you can put your mum on it or anyone on it because it's going to be super docile. What's really cool about fully flight controlled systems is you can control how aggressive they behave. So we think we've got a really big advantage over those guys, although we love their tech. We love the guys. Uh, Josh knows the guys personally. Um, I know them only by reputation. So that's one company. There's another couple of companies uh, out of Europe that are still, I don't know, I guess they're, they've got craft that fly. Um, uh, at the moment, we see them as maybes that they might get up. Um, I don't think they're as far along the path uh, technically as we are. More broadly, in electric hydrofoiling is actually a really busy startup space uh, in boats that start at sort of, I guess, in the eight to 10 metres, 12 metres range. Um, there's, I'd say, four companies that would put themselves in leadership positions in that at the moment. Um, there's a company out of Belfast. There's a company in the Bay Area of San Francisco, a company out of Sweden. Um, those companies are further down the funding track than us and are doing roadshows demonstrating boats. Um, and, and we love them. We're big fans of those companies. Uh, but the secret truth that we have internally is our hydrofoil technology is better. So when we get to that market, which we will after this recreational space, uh, we're going to go there with a hydrofoiling system that is can fly higher above the waves and maneuver more aggressively. So it's a really busy space. It's an exciting space. It's growing faster than any other marine segment in the world by a long shot. Um, it's, it's in my time since the 90s in marine, I've never seen an industry expansion this fast as the electric hydrofoil and boat uh, segment. Um, so yeah, it's a busy space. We think that's exciting. We think that means that it's real. Um, and it's a great opportunity for us to, to take a leadership position with technical advantage. Brilliant. It sounds really exciting. Is there any way that you can avoid underwater collisions? Not currently. That's the truth. Um, what we what we can do is manage how that, what happens when you make that collision. Um, I can't talk about it today uh, because, frankly, I haven't written the patent. Um, that patent will be released, I would say, within the next uh, two months. Uh, once that's released, you're going to be hearing a lot about it from us because we think it's going to be as powerful or more powerful than the W foil patent. Um, it's a, it's the dirty question. If you ask a hydrofoil company, what happens when you hit something, they'll generally offer you a beer, a wine or a coffee and talk about something else. Um, <laughs> uh, because, you know, of course, if you hit something hard and fast, then you, you're going to stop quickly, which you will in a boat, mm. but there's certainly a fear about that. Um, we yeah. think we have a solution for that. Uh, and I guess at this stage, I, all I can say is watch that space because um, I'm yeah. really excited about being able to talk about that in the coming months. Um, there, is a, there is other technology we've been uh, developing like uh, underwater sensing, and we can actually mount a camera in the apex of the A-tail to look forward underwater. So things like that are features that only we can have because of our unique W foil um, to give that underwater visibility. So there's some exciting stuff happening in uh, sensing as well that we'll be continuing to work on, but uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, I, I forgot one point, uh, Emily. Um, yeah, what, one thing you can do about it that's real today and will be delivered with the boats is you can geofence, which basically mm. says you you the boat has a, a, a marine chart in it and either the operator, if you're a rental fleet operator, you can say, well, look, I, want, I only want the customers to operate in this little area. I don't want them going off down there and getting lost and I don't want them running into this pier. So geofencing basically means that when the boat approaches a, a le electronic fence or a, a computer controlled space, the boat slows down and stops. Mm. And then when you turn around, you can go fast again. So it's kind of, it's basically like uh, putting the boat on a leash uh, using software. Um, and the other nice thing about our craft, because they are automatically controlled, if you do have a rogue customer uh, who's not behaving well, you can take over control of the boat and bring the boat back to the pen. So um, it's like once you have a fully controlled system that's fully computer controlled, really whatever clients want can be delivered in terms of functionality. Yeah, That's really exciting. I'm imagining it like as well in a car that's got sensors. Um, so if you're coming up to an obstacle, it slows down, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So that's a future development for us. Um, we uh, have... We'll do that with an industry partner because there's heaps and heaps of work that's been done on automation. 
um, our boats are autonomous system ready, that basically that you can bolt on an, anyone's autonomous system to our boats. Um, so we'll see, we might work with more than one partner too, depending on the industry. Um, but we've got really good conversations going on with autonomous systems providers right now uh, with really good commercial terms, actually. Um, they're, they're very friendly. So uh, our boats are ready for it and can be delivered with it um, straight away. Brilliant. So what are the recharging options regarding power and interfaces? So these little recreational boats would generally be charged either from a shore-based charging station or or a little suitcase charger that you can throw in the back of your car. Um, so you can you can power from a uh, 240 volt you know general power outlet or GPO, uh, which is the same you know a normal household power plug, um, or you can charge from three phase. Charging from a single phase, you, you're, you're talking about several hours to charge. Um, from a three-phase outlet, it's a, about an hour for a full recharge. The way we operate the boat, where we're running demos and doing testing, is if you run around for a few, a couple of hours, you plug it in for 25 minutes and charge it up and keep going. Um, but if you wanted to do a full recharge from from a depleted battery to full charge, it's an hour. And I think that's something that's I can say that easily in a sentence. But most electrical devices are overnight charging. Yeah, most lithium-ion devices is at several hours to charge. So we're really excited mm -hmm. this boat. You can basically run it around all morning, uh, charge it while you're having lunch, uh, and then run around all afternoon. So uh, the char the fast charging uh, capability is a really cool part of it. And that's yeah. that's enabled by water cooling the batteries. Um, uh, if you keep the batteries cool, you can charge them at a much higher rate. And just to add to that, uh, it makes it very attractive for commercial operations for having a, a long endurance and a short charge time, which is almost the opposite for a non hydro falling boat. They end up um, not having much endurance and having a long charge time with a big battery. Mm -hmm. So us having a smaller battery and uh, being able to get long endurance, uh, you can rent it out for a period, come back, fast charge it, rent it out again, and you can just keep doing that in a very economically viable way. Awesome. So we've had a few questions around um, what investment actually means uh, for people investing at this stage. Essentially, you'll be getting fully paid ordinary shares in the company. Um, I mean, this is an interesting question, probably one that's really difficult to answer, um, which is what are the chances of the company running out of money before it regularly returns a profit? So early stage companies at this point, um, you know, you're investing in a company that isn't listed on a um, a public exchange um, such as um, the ASX. So your shares are what's called illiquid. Um, there are opportunities in the future to um, have an exit. So they might be a share buyback scheme. They might list on a public exchange. Uh, they um, might be purchased by another company. There's a few ranges of how you might uh, receive a return on your investment down the track. Um, I would encourage you to do uh, your own research on this as well, but it's a, it would be considered a medium to long-term investment before you are to you know, expect a return of any kind. I hope that makes yeah. sense. And I can add to that, and obviously we can't promise or guarantee any return on investment, uh, no forward-looking statements and things like that. But what I would say is you are investing in a very capable team. So Paul uh, is a seasoned you know, entrepreneur with decades of experience commercializing marine technology. So he knows what to and not to do. And he's been very diligent in this commercialization path to, to make sure we uh, do get to a commercial outcome that's, uh, that's growth. And for me, I've uh, started and grown several companies and been through a lot of school of hard knocks of of what not to do and, and how to avoid running out of money and running out of um, runway. Um, and so for us, we're very, very, um, I guess, diligent entrepreneurs these days. We're not, you know, early stage, first time founders. We're really at the point now where we're doing this because we know and we feel confident in our ability to go to the next phase of commercialization, uh, raising more money, increasing the valuation. So yeah, we're quite confident in that, but obviously no guarantees and it always has risks, but the industry is definitely growing. So we're in a very high growth sector. And there's no real regulatory hurdles or limitations like I've experienced in other industries with drones and, and manned electric aircraft. The hydrofoil industry, if anything, the regulations promote adoption of electric hydrofoils because they're often banning petrol engines at most of the waterways. 
So you could argue um, we've actually got a, uh, a tailwind of regulatory assistance rather than a headwind of uh, regulatory uh, limitation. Yeah. I think the other point I'd say on that is, <laughs> to put uh, the, the uh, heat on myself, um, running out of money for me is uh, generally uh, not prudent management. Um, what norm, what the way our funding affects us is how much we can do and how fast we can accelerate the business. Um, generally, startup companies, if they fail, it's because they overextend. Um, so really what we're looking for is support through this fundraise to accelerate going into the market. Uh, how much engagement we get from the community uh, really impacts our, how quickly and how much impact we can have in the world, which is a really fast growing electric hydrofoil industry. And so the support we're seeking is the support to really become, take a leading position in that. If we get less support, then we move more slowly uh, and, we'll, and we'll continue to seek, and we will be for some years continuing to raise additional funding. Thank you. Are there any intentions to do more roadshows in Australia? Yes, um, but again, funding, su subject to funding. One of the people are welcome, generally speaking, <laughs> with the, within the constraints of our personnel to come and have a, and, and have a look at the boat if they're in Perth. Obviously, Perth's a very long way uh, from anyone on the east coast of Australia. Um, but yeah, so we were at the Sanctuary Cove Boat Show uh, in Brisbane a few months ago, and certainly, uh, depending on the uptake from this um, race, to some extent, we, we would definitely aim to do east coast roadshows, give people a chance to experience the craft because that's something we really want to do because everyone who even old friends of mine who have been involved in my previous businesses uh who know i will deliver when they get on the boat they literally come in wide-eyed and like wow that was really cool this is you're, you're really onto something here so it's in our best interest to get people in the boat because um it, it kind of looks kind of cool on the videos but it's a lot cooler to ride Paul, I want to get in the boat. Every time I see the videos, <laughs> it just looks so fun. Yeah, yeah, it really is. When I when I joined the company, uh, obviously I did my due diligence on the industry and clearly that was expanding fast. So there was a big opportunity. The, the patents were really what got me in into the business. It's like they've got some really good IP protection here, something that has meaning to the clients. It's not just some nerdy technical benefit. Um, but when I rode the thing, it's like, Crikey, this, uh, this is really going to change what people expect out of boating. So, yeah, I'm excited to get you in the boat, Emily, as soon as possible. <laughs> Excellent. So how will the funds raised be used? To, to go from uh, a robust and proven demonstrator to do the production planning and production engineering to go into production. We're, we're very fortunate to have a community of people that have reached out saying that they would like to to own one of these vessels. Um, we are lucky that having engaged really pretty deeply with those people, we, we also understand their price sensitivities and their feature uh, preferences. So that will drive um, uh, future product development. Um, so we've got clients that are willing to buy very expensive boats at limited edition and other clients that are that a, a broader number of clients that are willing to buy at a lower price point. Um, and we know how to engineer that. So that's what we're going to spend the money on is the production planning, production engineering. We're very fortunate to be in conversation with production partners um, in the US, in uh, South Korea and in uh, Dubai. Um, so we're, we're really in a good place to go into production. It's just the internal work required to plan that and have the blueprints to do that. And that's, that's the only thing holding us back from delivering craft. And that's what we're going to spend the money on. Awesome. So subject to funding, how many boats will be built in the initial handcrafted phase? And would this make money for the company or help iron out problems or both? Uh, so our pricing policy is, I think, it's conservative and prudent. Um, part of the reason why we hopefully won't run out of money. Uh, we're pricing based on a 50% GP. Um, we've allowed a 20% discount for distributors. We believe that at that kind of craft in that kind of industry, that's reasonable and will allow us to engage distribution partners. Um, so, so based on the cost of goods sold, yes, we'll make money out of selling the boats. Um, 
the truth is we're not going to make a lot of money out of selling uh, the first votes. No one makes lots of money out of selling their first batch. Um, but we would certainly like to conservatively break even. Um, and we're not in the business of selling votes off balance sheets uh, because that is a very fast way to go bust. Uh, and unfortunately, there's quite a few instances of that globally uh, in the voting industry startup phase uh, that have done that. Um, they've raised a lot of money and they've spent the money subsidizing sales. And it's a very great way to turn a billion dollars into nothing. So we're not going to be doing that. We'll be selling on a reasonable return with a high expectation of making money off the first batch. Might not be much money, um, but breaking even. And oh, sorry, you asked about uh, MOQ. So we've we've basically announced publicly that we're, with we'll build uh, based on an MOQ of twenty boats. So once we've got firm deposits on twenty boats, we'll go into production for that for that model. Perfect. We are running out of time, so we've got time for just one more question. Um, so in terms of different regulatory requirements and need for approvals in different areas of the world, do you anticipate there'll be significant lead times to achieve these or is there restrictions that will prevent the boat going into production in certain areas? The, the, how do I answer that? If you The best way to do that, and I've been involved in designing boats my whole career since 1991, um, the best way to manage regulation is to engage productively with regulation at the outset. All these horror stories about regulations preventing people going into the market is because they didn't engage with the regulators at the beginning. They designed a boat and then they went to the regulator and said, oh, we want to come into your jurisdiction and sell boats into the US or to Germany or somewhere. And what they've not done is engage with the regulators at the outset. So our team are seasoned boat designers uh, we always involve uh, both class and the flag states and the government's um, customs agencies. All of those three entities have different requirements. And it's really about engaging with those guys at the outset, at the, at the very first day when you write the design basis. Um, so that's how we, we manage that. Yes, there are regulations uh, and the, the ability to stop that causing commercial difficulty is to engage with them early, which we will. Great. Sure. Thank you so much. Did you want to say anything, Josh? Did I cut you well, off? Well, just to add to that, what I was amazed with, because my background in drones and uh, aviation is quite regulatory challenging, a lot thicker uh, amount of certification to abide by. When we first got the registration for the first jet ski, the hydrofold, um, the sort of tick box exercise of, is this okay? Like but working with the Department of Transport, it was like, okay, well, it's less power than it started as a jet ski, so that's fine. It's less noise, so that's fine. It's less pollution, that's great. Less wake. So all the things that they usually want to enforce and control and avoid you, you know, doing, um, we our technology is somewhat better accepted or, or more readily accepted um, because obviously they don't want people making more noise, more wake, more pollution. Um, you know, that's why two strokes were banned and four strokes became mainstream because they were trying to really regulate these things. So uh, really, the technology early on addressed the fact that the things that they regulate we already do better in the first place. So we're in a very strong position to be well accepted internationally. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, I will wind it up here because we have run out of time now, but if anybody does have any additional questions, you can reach out to the team via their virtual profile. There's a message function on the profile and that will connect you directly with the team. If you do have any questions about investment, please reach out to support at virtual.com and we'll be happy to help you out. Um, but if you haven't already, please express your interest via the virtual profile. I've popped the link in the chat box there as well. Uh, thank you so much, Paul and Josh, for coming on and sharing your time with us. And thank you, everybody, for your time today and for your great questions. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Thanks, Emily. Emily. And thank you for uh, your attendance. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank Take you. care. Great questions. See ya.